Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this morning's session, Regeneration and Return. Uh, we're just going to get started because we are running a bit of a tight ship this morning. I'd like to start by acknowledging the Aranda people, the traditional owners of this land uh, on which this festival has been taking place and all the space they've held for conversation on this place, both over this weekend and through other festivals and the continued custodianship and care they show for country and all the ways that we can learn about regeneration, the theme of this panel from them. And welcome any elders present and all other First Nations people in the room. A small bit of housekeeping. Uh, if you have a mobile phone on you, please turn it to phone mode or off. We have four fantastic writers and thinkers here this morning for the session. Um, I'm going to introduce them to you in a minute, but I'll just let you know how this session's going to go and what we're going to talk about. Uh, the session, Regeneration and Return, we're going to talk a little bit about the themes in this session, uh, hearing from each of the authors about their work. And then we're going to open up to about 15 minutes of questions. So if you've got something burning you do want to ask, uh, work on that in your mind into the most succinct, nuggety question that you can possibly <laughs> ask. Um, and we'll have some time for those. But first, regeneration and return. Whether for metaphor, solace or self-understanding, writers have returned to nature. But what is it to write in an age of monumental environmental change, of transformation of places we live in and love? Bushfires, melted ice caps, endings and extinction, we call on scribes of all kinds for their insights and antidotes. Is it too late to regenerate the earth? Now, I'd like to welcome... Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about our panel this morning. Uh, first on at the end, we have Monica Galliano. Monica is a research pro associate professor of evolutionary ecology. She is currently based at the University of Sydney as a research affiliate at the Sydney Environment Institute and is a senior research fellow at the School of Life and Environmental Sciences, opening the doors to of a brand new BI lab, Biological Intelligence Lab. Her most recent book is Thus Spoke the Plant, which is available from the bookstore. And Galliano has pioneered the, new the brand new research world of plant bioacoustics. It's a, it's a fantastic read um, for anyone who is scared of you know, science books like me. Don't be. This is just, it takes you into the heart mm. of, of what it means to be with plants. Welcome, Monica. Thank you. Next to Monica is Charles Massey. Charles has been farming for more than 40, for 40 years, developing merino sheep stud business. Growing concerns about the degradation of land and human sustainability challenge led him to undertake a PhD in human ecology. He has authored several books, including the widely acclaimed Breaking the Sheep's Back, which was with University of Queensland Press, and his work has been shortlisted for the Prime Minister's Literary Awards. He's here at the festival talking with us about Call of the Reed, Call of the Reed Warbler, which has been a transformational book on regenerative agriculture and the connection between our soil and our health. Um, huge book, huge ideas. Really look forward to hearing from you today. Welcome, Charles. Our next writer is Curly Saunders. Um, this book has been this tender... Mm. Uh, Kindred has been this tender companion to me over the last few weeks. Curly is a proud Gunai woman with ties to the Yuin, Gunungurra, Gadigal and Birupai people. She is currently manager of Poetic Learning and Aboriginal Cultural Liaison at Red Room Poetry, where she founded the Poetry in First Languages project, which has been doing work in Central Australia over the last week with Declan. Yeah, it's yeah. been really powerful. Mm. Yeah. Her first children's book, The Incredible F Freedom Machines, which is also available at the bookstore, illustrated by Matt Otley, has been published internationally. Her, first, her forthcoming titles include Our Dreaming and Happily Ever After, as well as her current poetry collection, which is just out, Kindred. Her poetry is being published by Corda and Overland and, is embedded in, in infrastructure, and she is embedded in infrastructure at Darling Harbour and the Royal Botanical Gardens, Melbourne. And finally, last but not least, is Steve Morton. Steve is an honorary professoral fellow with Charles Darwin University. 
He studied at University of Melbourne, California and Sydney and joined CSIRO in Alice Springs to work on the, in the desert environment that has been long been his focus. In 2011, he returned to Alice Springs, where he serves on committees around Australia relating to environmental science. He is currently writing a book about the ecology of Australian deserts. Please put your welcome, uh, put your welcome, put your hands together in welcome for Monica, Charles, Kelly, and Steve Morton. To start off our, uh, there's, there's a really big question underlying this, this panel and it's, is it too late to regenerate the earth? And I can't bear myself to put this at, uh, in the first question, so I'm going to start instead with asking each of you about the earth and your relationship with the earth. Because as I started to read through your work, I noticed that this, this relationality was central to so much of what you were all talking about. So as by way of introducing yourselves to this topic and the audience as well. Can you let me know, how do you relate to, relate to nature? What are the origins of this relationship and how has this intersected and changed with your writing practice over the years? I don't know if you want to start. Um, so being a, um, a proud Ghana girl and um, having ties with a ton of different First Nations, um, I, I would definitely say that my work is influenced um, by the earth. My name, Curly, is the name for a black and white bird that lives on the water. Uh, so, you know, born of the earth and, and gifted a name of a bird. Um, I tend to sit with the earth uh, to move through, to find healing and uh, to write and reflect on my experiences. And uh, it's been really interesting for me this week working in Central Australia uh, and being wrapped in this space by that you're in, you're dreaming, um, and to be so far from salt water. And so much of my time is spent in the bush and um, by the salt water. And so uh, my writing this week has taken a big change in uh, the way that it's written on chapped earth instead of, uh, well, now, now wet chapped earth, which is pretty special. Mm. Um, but yeah, I, it's definitely evident. Uh, all of my works bring, bring in the theme of the earth. Yeah. You go. Um, I, I grew up as an only child and uh, so pretty much from about the age of four or five I just went bush naturally mm. and then <coughs> ended up um, going to university wanting to become a zoologist uh, uh, and an eth ethologist and animal behaviourist but my father had a heart attack and I ended up coming home when I was 22, finished uni part time and took over management and growing up on a farm doesn't mean you know how to manage uh, 5,000 acres of country, uh, beautiful grassland, and so I sought the best advice, which happened to be industrial, and proceeded to do great damage. And um, by the end of the, a five-year drought in the 80s, I had a huge debt, and um, we had to sell a bit of country, and I realised there had to be a better way of doing it. And, and I'd been working against my own biophilic uh, mm -hmm. sensitivities, if you like. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's when I started to learn about this new form of ecological or regenerative agriculture. Not sustainable, but regenerative means open-ended. And also befriending a senior lawman, a local indigenous and Garrigo man, uh, also impacted. And to answer your question, um, I see our landscape, which has been degraded, um, as something living that can be improved, but we have to very sensitively respect uh, almost every, our every footstep, really. And, and these new regenerative tools are enabling us to start to bring it back to some semblance of health. Mm. Monica? Is Steve asleep? No, he's okay. contemplating, okay. I believe. <laughs> <laughs> um. I'm wide awake. <laughs> <laughs> well, my... Um, my story is actually almost the opposite way. I was uh, born in a very suburban environment, and um, and I said this before. Um, my parents, especially my mum, thought that uh, nature was dirty, something that you keep outside, well outside of the confinements of the walls, which have been cleaned and you know shined and polished, and and so. Um, I guess it was out of uh, a sense of starvation 
rather than being embraced and be always in connection and contact with. It was um, out of a sense of starvation that I was always seeking the outside. And, uh, and the closest nature that I had when I was uh, growing up, although I grew up really um, close at the bottom of the, at the feet of the, of the Alps, so you would think, you know, that it's a pretty young and strong and vibrant nature. But my parents never went there. <laughs> and uh, so I only had, um, and it's quite ironical, actually, I had a goldfish in a tank, of course, um, and a bird in a cage, of course. And, uh, and what I would do, especially with the bird, with the fish was a bit difficult, but with the bird, I would, um, when, uh, when my mom wasn't there watching, I would close the doors and the windows and I would just get the bird out of the cage and like talk to it and say like, one day you're going to have to fly. So you better get some practice runs here. <laughs> and so it would just, I would just let this bird, you know, flying around in the room and, um, I, I, I'm still surprised I didn't get a heart attack, but, um, and then, you know, put it back in the cage, apologizing that, you know, this is what it is for now, but one day you're going to fly. And, uh, and that was my connection with nature. Um, yeah, my mom did find some poos. <laughs> <laughs> and that is the, is the real dirt that gave it away. <laughs> But of course, growing up, that desire for connection has never really left because I think it's uh, in everyone. So it can be caged or put in a, in a glass bowl or uh, pretend that it's not there, but we're made of it. So it's not, it's not going anywhere. And uh, I guess then I had the opportunity, and I'm very blessed that I had the opportunity to uh, go to university, which of course is another form of, is another cage. But at this point, I was the bird that knew that one day I'm going to fly, and this cage has got open doors. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to pretend to use the cage and pretend to sit quietly in my little cage mm -hmm. and swing in the little mm -hmm. swing inside. And, um, but the door is open, and I take my flights in and out. And, uh, and yeah, this has been, uh, not, it, it wouldn't be possible if I didn't know that I had strong wings and big feathers and yeah, and I was supported. So, and I guess that comes through both my science and now this writing, which I don't know what you call it, but that. <laughs> Thank you, Monica. Steve. Yeah, well, like, like uh, Charles, I grew up on a farm and, and um, I, I can close my eyes and in an instant re recall moments of perfection and belonging that have, will last for my entire life. So mm. the direct answer to your question is, um, for me, it's fundamental. Mm. I, I don't know how you can... I, I'm just fascinated by landscape. I mean, as things have transpired, I've moved from the Murray River to Alice Springs because this is the place that appeals to me beyond anything else I've ever seen. Uh, and in any case, um, my, my parents were, were readers and as we heard in the last session, uh, books became just a, as fundamental a part of my life as landscape. Mm. Um, and then that, that life of the mind turned into my career as, a, as an ecologist. So mm. for, for me, uh, the earth's fundamental. Uh, how we react, how we respond, to the challenges being thrust upon us. Well, that's another, that's another step. But the starting point for me is, is um, this, this place is, surely we can look after it better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Charles, in that, in that idea of looking after it better, and you describe regenerative agriculture um, as, you know, the importance of getting out of the way of nature. Can you tell us more about this and the role of actually letting place lead us? down a more regenerative path? Yeah, it's a key question. Uh, where I was at Australian National University in the uh, Fenner School of Environment and Society, every document, every paragraph had the word sustainable in it. <laughs> and to me now, it's a bit passe. To me, it means sort of, or can mean just marking time. The idea of regeneration is... Um, it's, it's simpatico with... Because when I went back to uni, I had 40 years of catch-up 
away from academia so, and we'd had computers and systems thinking and enormous amount of research in that intervening period. I had to uh, do a lot of reading and one of the things that intrigued me was, it was the new understanding of complex adaptive systems, of which there's about 12 traits and I had to teach master's students so I had to really get my head around it. And a couple of things, a couple of those traits really stood out and one of them was that when you have these complex adaptive systems, which is an ecological, it can be an ecological system, a catchment, even a farm, it can be the World Wide Web, but um, when it's disturbed or degraded, it has a capacity, if enabled, to self-organise itself back to a state of health or, or um, a better state. So I'm just having breakfast with a the fly there. <laughs> um, and that really hit me because what we've done with Western agriculture is totally both degrade and suppress those inherent functions. And uh, that's, if you go back to the roots of the word regeneration, it, it's a, a Latin word, uh, regeneratus, which um, means to renew, uh, etc. And there's, there's, there's also ethical connotations with it. And so what we're now finding... When we go back with ecological grazing and cropping, um, it's like taking the handcuffs up, off and the, the soil biology gets going and it self-organises back and fixes carbon and you get diversity and all that sort of stuff. And it's, that to me is regeneration. It's open-ended mm -hmm. and the consequences are, um, that does apply to our earth systems. We can, um, through better practices, really start playing a role in turning around this, this Anthropocene crisis that we're in. Just picking up on that, letting the handcuffs off and, and actually, you know, listening, listening to the land. I just want to pick up on a theme in your work, Monica, where you talk about your work as a phytobiography. So it's a book written by and with plants. Mm. So what is it that you've learnt through your work of listening to plants, both in the lab and outside? And how might we, the rest of us, learn from that about what do we need to do to listen to plants better? <laughs> Um, <clears throat> well, it's a, first of all, it's a personal affair. And like any affair, any love affair, uh, you need to be really committed and involved and allow for that passion to deliver you wherever it wants to go rather than, uh, you know, predefined places. And... Um, and of course, um, we are quite comfortable with love affairs to do that. They're exciting, they are painful, but in a good way. And, and then when it comes to have a love affair with um, our way of being with the world or of the world, uh, it seems like we switch into a different mode. <laughs> and, um, and you know, what would it happen if, uh, how, would it, how would the world look like if we were in this passionate love affair with being here and really just be swept away all the time by like, oh my God, I can't stop thinking about this place. I can't stop thinking about the next meeting, the next encounter, as if it was a lover, but it's a much bigger lover, a lover that will never drop you, a lover that would never actually betray you, no matter actually what you do. And um, so I think it's a question of entering in this love affair and then everything speaks. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. In that, um, in entering that love affair, and it reminds me of the intense relationality uh, that we see through your work, Curly, um, both, you know, weaving in uh, connection to place through time, through healing ancestral connection is something that you've talked about. And also, you know, connections with other people in your life. I feel like I really got to know other people in your life as well as other places in your life. And when we spoke to at, our, at the writer's breakfast, you mentioned the importance of language in the land. So yeah. quite, um, you know, quite physical connections between place and between language. Can you tell us a bit more about the role of language in restoring relationship with land and also how this impacts your own, how, how you do this in your own work, in your writing and also in your work with Red Room. Yeah, so, um, I mean, First Nations languages, um, they were around, anyway, I've been told 550 to 650, possibly up to 700 different um, dialects 
across Australia. So uh, the Poetry in First Languages program seeks to uh, provide publishing outcomes for First Nations people through language, and they write those poems with custodians and elders on country, um, and usually following their, their kinship lines, so uh, following those matrilineal or patrilineal lines. Um, so that's one element of the project. And then another part is to see those poets go and work on country with elders and custodians and with First Nations students to support them to write poems. Um, so we commissioned Declan Ferber-Gillick, a local um, poet and playwright, um, to go out into community this week. And I was really lucky to accompany him and then to go out into uh, Chinjapura. And what I saw was that the language that the students used was a course... Um, language from this land, Arunba language, um, and the, the words that they were using were words for this land. So they don't have words for sea here, of course. Um, and so in that way, land mimic, uh, language mimics the landscape. It's used to describe words from the nation that we're working on. Um, and within that way, the language changes across landscape too. And we can also see the way that language um, is passed through the landscape, the way that language follows an escarpment or um, a mountain range, um, the way that language follows song lines in that way um, and has a journey. And so, um, you know, working with kids when they're when they're learning about that and reconnecting them back to the earth and quite often I'm working with kids who are in areas that have been heavily colonized and so there is no this is their first language learning journey this is the first step for them um, they get to see the landscape with new eyes when they're learning new words for it and in doing so they also see themselves with new eyes um, and they have new ways of describing themselves through their poetry um, that is tied to the land that they're on so um, and I think you know they, they find a love for the land in a different way when they're learning language um, and then also the land learns to love them in a different way um, one of the one of the custodians we work with said you've got to call things by their right name you know I said, what do you mean? And he's like, that, that bird, that lyre bird, which is a special bird for me, it's a totem. Um, that's the Naran Naran here. And I said, the Naran Naran. He's like, yeah. The, when the kids, when they speak the Naran Naran, they speak him up, they call him here. You watch, we'll see the Naran Naran. And I was like, yeah, righto. Um, and I'm sitting there and, it, you know, we'd done the Naran Naran dance, we'd danced up country. And in the next session, this lyre bird flew, and I don't know if you've ever seen one fly, but they are phenomenal in the way they fly, um, straight over the top of the kids and landed in the middle of the circle, kind of looked around like, hey, guys, and then just toddled off. Um, and I looked at Jacob, and he's like, see, you, you have to dance them up. You have to, you have to speak them up. You have to call them here by their right name. You know, if somebody called you Patricia, you wouldn't answer. I said, no. And he said, well, you know, you're curly. He's narn narn. So, um, yeah, it's a really lovely learning experience that happens in the classroom. And I think uh, learning language has helped me in my writing of poetry too. And now um, when I... Uh, I've always really loved, you know, learning by the land. You mentioned before um, growing up in the bush. I remember my dad taking me out as a kid and plunking me in the bush somewhere with my siblings and saying, all right, find your way home. It's about two hours before it gets dark. Dad, if you don't get home... We'll send the dogs out to find you, all right? You'll be right. And we're like, oh. Um, and then becoming so familiar with the landscape that we could find our way anywhere in the bush behind our house. Um, you know, we knew how to follow the creeks and the escarpment. And, um, yeah, I, I, as I've learned the words for those different things back home now, um, I see it with new eyes and, and it finds new ways um, of falling into my writing. Thank you. Just got... Um I forgot my job. I was just listening and just... <laughs> <laughs> um, Steve, in your article on pessimism in Australian ecology, um, you know, so much, so much of what we've heard, we've heard is, 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 ho is about hope and connection. In this article, you really take apart pessimism and you occupy it from different perspectives through this essay. And for an academic essay, it's an incredibly... Um, brave and really invigorating like, thing to read. Stupid uh, thing to do. <laughs> yeah, no. I think, I think the best things we do are stupid. Um, <laughs> that's, that's, that's where the fun happens. So you do this, though, to look at the role of pessimism in Australian econ ecology, as the title suggests, but you come out proposing acceptance and hope as potential frameworks for ecologists to engage more effectively with discussion and to overcome um, the shutdown, and this is something that Charles and I were talking about, is the shutdown that can happen when we start to see the future as hopeless. Mm. So what is it that we need to accept and, and, and what is the shape of hope? And 
I'm going to start this question with you and then open it up to the panel as well. Yeah, th thank you. Yeah. So I've got to, I've got to get a grip on myself here because I could probably talk about this for 10 or 15 minutes and you won't want me to. Well, maybe I will anyway. Um, they gave you a mic. Yeah. Yeah, you've got, so, you've got time. <laughs> so, look, confession, starting point. Um, this is not an, in, an intellectually defensible stance. I, I, there are other things that I'd like to talk about that, that might have intellectual rigour in them. This one is purely an emotional reaction. Mm. I, 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 cannot, I cannot bear pessimism. It exhausts me. Uh, it drains me of energy. Uh, now, I, I say that right up front because I then instantly have to return to the reality, which is the, the, the great acceleration in human impact on the earth and, and our success, to put it another way, is, is led to the Anthropocene, as Charles has already mentioned. Um, th there will be a set of crises coming at us. It's, it's already unfolding. That, that, that's the reality. I, I know that. Mm. But what I can't deal with is those who want to go on diagnosing with, with endless litany of disaster and, mm. and misanthropy and greed and all the rest of it. I know all that. Mm -hmm. uh, what I'm after emotionally is something to give me hope. Pessimism is, is a recipe for despair. It, it is not a motivator. H hope is the elixir of action. And, and I've, never been, I've never been able to explain this. Uh, it, it, uh, I understand, going back to the intellectual part of my brain, that, that human society is composed of people with different starting points and different views. For me, who finds pessimism draining and exhausting, other members of the human population actually get their energy out of being pessimistic and diagnosing the problem and getting angry about it and saying, you must do something. Mm. I understand that intellectually, but I can't do it myself. So when I'm looking at writers and thinkers who, who stimulate and excite me, that they are people who understand the importance of hope. Mm. So you know, to go right back to your opening question, is it too late to save the earth? Well, what a ridiculous question. <laughs> of course it's not too late. When is it ever too late? All that pessimism does is say to the, to the listener, stop the world, I want to get off it. That's yeah. not productive. So, so, so then, of course, you're going to come straight back at me and say, well, what are you going to do? And that's, mm -hmm. But I'm, I might let others have a say at this point. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. That was, can we? Uh, really yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the Poetry in First Languages project, um, I could see that kids were writing about, you know, identity and well-being, and I thought that was really important. But I wanted to find ways for them to step into their role as custodians, um, their role as First Nations people in community and, and, and emerging elders, because I believe that the kids that we work with, they're, they're going to be, you know, they'll be the thinkers and the movers and the shakers who will shape the world for First Nations people moving forward. And so... Um, I started working with uh, some, some Gumi Adarawal uh, language custodians who use traditional firekeeping practices to burn uh, the bushland to make sure that um, they, they call it upside down country, which is where um, the trees, uh, the canopies don't form properly because all of the nutrients are going into the understory. Um, and so, you know, we were having them come onto country and, and have this practice and then you, having kids learn about their, sorry, fires, <laughs> learn about the, um, the practice and then use the charcoal to write their poems in charcoal and make artworks out of it um, so that they could connect with that, that knowledge without, you know, the oh and issue of having kids do backburning. Um, and then beyond that, we had on, on uh, Gunungara country, um, the glossy black gocker too, which is a, a, a special, special bird for me, um, is a threatened species there. And so um, we had students learn about the glossy black gocker too, replant she oaks um, all around the community, and then write poems about the glossy black gocker too in Gunungara language. And they'll be reading at the community event when I return um, back home. So, you know, that, that role of, you know, with hope with um, the dream of inspiring others in the community to make change in a powerful way um, and with the, that traditional custodianship knowledge that we are responsible for caring for country um, and caring for country means caring for our animals and especially threatened species. Look, I, I couldn't endorse Steve's comments more. Um, where I'm based still at ANU, <coughs> a lot of the leading climate other scientists are there. Uh, come back from the international panels, they're coming back more depressed. And, but what I've seen now, travelling both uh, throughout Australia and internationally, the, the, 
this bottom-up revolution, uh, not just from farmers, but people interested in healthy food, in peri-urban and urban areas. We've got extraordinary solutions, and, and, uh, and it's not just climate. And, and what epitomised it was when, um, uh, about 18 months ago, one of the world's leading uh, social and environmental change agents, Paul Hawken, got sick of... 15 years ago, he asked all the climate scientists, so what do we do about it? And they said, oh, I don't, we don't know, we're just crunching the numbers on chemistry, etc." And so he commissioned 70 uh, scientists and experts around the world to come up with the 100 best solutions to draw down carbon dioxide from the air or prevent it going up. And cut a long story short, I've got to know him. And if you aggregate the six or seven regenerative agriculture examples in it, put them together, uh, practices of uh, renewing ecological function, uh, uh, the number one best way by nearly two and a half times the, the nearest method of ha addressing the climate issue. And, and then when I do a lot of workshops with farmers and um, if you mention climate, the eyes glaze over and all the rest of it. But if you say, well, look, this extraordinary earth, our blue-green planet, of which there's only one, and life itself created conditions on, uh, for that life to exist, it, it is actually this self-organising system of nine key planetary systems, of which climate's only one. You've got land use and biodiversity and the others. And once we start regenerating, pulling carbon and putting it into the soil to get the soil going, it, it has knock-on effects throughout all the others. And I'm not saying we're going to get back to where it was originally, especially uh, our European mind assumed that this country functioned like Europe, and it doesn't, and that's why the damage has been so drastic but we can renew these functions. So um, I totally endorse both uh, Kiri and Steve. I, I, I'm optimistic we can make a difference. Monica, what is the shape of hope for you? Um, I don't like hope. <laughs> 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 I do not like hope. Hope <laughs> contains the seed of doubt. It almost like, I hope it's gonna work out, <laughs> but maybe there is a chance that it won't. I like trust, and trust, even the word, is like, a, yes, there is no doubt. That's why trust is much more powerful, because it already puts you in a place where it's like, uh, we're just going to do this, simply. There is no even a question. The question of, like, can we? It's not a question. It's like, uh, if we hope that something will work out, no, we are trusting. We have the methods. We have the, the people. We have everything we need. And just like, um, we might just need to really see how much juice is here already. And, uh, and I mean, obviously, I, I don't know for you, but for me this morning, uh, I woke up and I did feel the flavor of um, tightening in my heart when I saw the results from our elections. And um, of course, it's the elephant in the room, isn't it? It's like uh, we're talking about regenerating, and, and then we have just uh, reestablished the old status quo, which is about destruction. But then uh, I was very blessed that a friend took me to, for a walk here in Alice, and, uh, and we went and saw some beautiful trees. And, uh, and as I sat then on my own for breakfast to just reflect on the two extremes, it's like on one side there's distraction and a, and a group of people that seem totally blind <laughs> to what's really going on. And then on the other side there is the beauty, the ancestral roots, literally, and, uh, and the river is flowing. These friends are like, uh, we haven't had rain for two years. And it's like, and I'm here, and it rained, and the river is flowing, it's like... Uh, it's not even a metaphor, it's right here. <laughs> and uh, if we can't see that, then yeah, we are really blind. And, and because of the river flowing, I realized, oh wow, no time for sleeping. And this is why we were just talking about it before, is like, uh, you know, if we had a slight inkling that we could just turn around with the doona, it's like, oh, I'll just wake up a bit later. Uh, well, what these uh, results are doing are just saying like, Mm -mm. the alarm is on, it's time, it's the day, off we go. <laughs> and there is lots of stuff to do, there is lots of people to support, there is lots of, there is lots of being to be. <laughs> and, um, and also, you know, I agree with you, Steve, pessimism 
it's really bad for your health. <laughs> It's really good that if you if you want to go down a particular road and die early, but <laughs> uh, it's really bad for your health. Is like uh, those kind of hormones um, shut down your adrenals and your kidneys will have to work really hard to filter out all of that. And yeah, nah, don't do it. It's not good for you. <laughs> yeah, trust that we got this, all of us. And this is the big difference, I think to use a very kind of religious metaphor, is like, you know, there's this idea that a savior will come, one dude usually would come and save us all, save the day, the big hero of all the stories. Well, this time the hero is the collective, and I agree, from the grassroots up, and it's happening everywhere. And maybe these um, characters that look so blind are exactly the medicine that we all need to wake up now. I think that what you say about, you know, the stories that, that we tell is, is, is really critical to, to our regeneration. And I think, you know, from whether we, uh, that, you know, people do sometimes find action in pessimism, but that we actually do need to that can only work if we have a level of trust that there is something to step into. And so thinking of this, what is the role of writers in regeneration? Why are you writing this work in this way? For, this is open for the panel. And, and what stories are going to help us walk into the future? So, you know, what is the role of writers in writing in regeneration? How does this interface with your work? And what stories can you see as able to actually help us both accept where we are and walk into a future. Can I have a go? Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so um, I mentioned my emotional reaction before. Now, now I want to try and say something I hope is intellectually rigorous. <laughs> and and it, it, it goes to the question you posed me before that I didn't get time to answer, yeah. which was about acceptance. Um, so we, we all know that there is a, a, a tsunami of change sweeping over global environments, and Australia will not be immune from those. Some of those changes are inexorable. There's no, nothing that you could do to stop them. And in fact, if ecology teaches you anything, it teaches you that no system is stable. Every system is in some form of process of flux. Even the deep sea trenches are not stable ecologically. Uh, ecosystems have this incredible ability to, to go their own way. When the environment around them changes, some of the species in them do better, some, some of the species do worse. Some species disappear, new ones arrive. There's a whole series of changes going on in the world that, that we cannot practically do anything about. And that, that leads you to this challenge of acceptance. Uh, at what point do you say to yourself intellectually, actually I can't do anything about this, so I will waste my time and become pessimistic in trying to do it. But acceptance is not a popular uh, concept in our society at the moment, and probably for good reasons. We, we accepted that religious orders would look after our children. And, and look what happened when people said, I'm not going to accept this anymore. The banks were, were charging dead people fees until finally someone stood up and said, I'm not going to accept this. So I understand why acceptance isn't a popular concept. But nevertheless, it's a living reality. I mean, the human condition is such that we, we, are, we are creative individuals with extraordinary minds who can imagine perfection, but we are condemned to live in an imperfect world. So there's always a gap between what we would like, what we would wish, what we desire, and what is real. Acceptance is the process by which you sort your way through this rigorously in order to determine what it is you might do. And that's the point. Acceptance has a purpose. It is to free you up to attack the problem you can do something about. And that's actually quite intellectually difficult. So where am I going with this? What, what I'm looking for in writers and thinkers are those who've done these hard yards, who said, I understand there, that the world might be not made to my liking. I'm going to choose those aspects of the world that I think I can change. That, that, that there is something you can achieve here. And, and actually, each of the three members of the panel sitting with me in their own ways have done this. I mean, Charles most practically and dramatically, but, but you, you as well. 
So, so that's what I'm looking for, is, is someone who is prepared to face up to the reality. You know that old serenity prayer? It's actually not that old. I think it's only 100 years old. You know, God, God, give me the serenity to accept the things that I cannot change, the courage to change the things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. So that's what I'm looking for in writers. Writers who will show me that they have actually figured out what it is that might be changed in the world effectively, and they've gone ahead and showed how to do it. Not, not just pointed the finger and said, you should do this, or you should stop doing that, but you've done it yourself and charted the pathway into the future, rather than just complaining about the miseries of the past and, and you know, contributing more to that misery literature, which I find so, so unpleasant. That's what I'm after. Practical <laughs> choices, rigorously thought through with intellectual... Uh, uh, with intellectual effort. That, that's what pleases me. Yeah. And a bloody good read. Um, <laughs> That'll help. <laughs> oh, look, I'm sounding too earnest. I want a bit of joy and happiness too. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Curly, regeneration and the role of writers in regeneration. And what, how does this, how does this, why does this affect your work? How does it come into your work? And what are the stories that we need to keep us, to help us move forward? Yeah, so um, I had an interesting um, interview that I was penning last night, the answers to, and one of the questions was, in a very white landscape, um, what, does your, what, work, what role does your work play in seeking to kind of decolonise the arts? Um, and I think, when I think of regeneration, I think of that. I think that, um, you know, writing in sharing language in a white line landscape, um, sharing first languages in a white landscape, seeks to regenerate those languages, seeks to share culture, um, seeks to break down colonialism in a literary form that has been maintained mostly um, with white um, voices for a long time. Um, and teaching language to kids helps them to see uh, the, the spaces that, that, can, um, that they can step into with their cultural knowledge. It helps them to find ways to walk in the black world and the white world, to operate out of cultural capital and to operate within the systems that exist at the moment and to find some kind of space in between where they can fit um, and where they can be accepted um, and where they can celebrate their cultural underpinnings. So um, I hope that the work that I write, I hope that the programs that I lead seek to regenerate in that way. Um, and I think the more that I so this regeneration, the more that emerging writers move through and start to operate in similar ways, the more that the landscape starts to change. Charles? Yes, I, I think the popularity of literary festivals tells us how important <laughs> uh, things like writing are, but also art, um, both of them using metaphors and symbols. And um, I know when I was analysing uh, you know, over a hundred hours of social interviews for my PhD, I had to get my head around uh, things like the role of metaphor, which is very ancient in the formation of the modern human. Um, it, we're hardwired for metaphor, and the other thing that really rocked me when I was reading some of the modern cognitive psychologists is that we're, we're over 90% subconscious, mm -hmm. which is important for writers, because if you can let that work away while you're sleeping or whatever, it's amazing how many things emerge from it. But, so I, I just think that the use of symbolism, metaphor in writing to tell this story of hope is just imperative to our future and that's the importance of um, these forms of communication. Yeah. Monica? I'm battling with I the know. flies. <laughs> I know. Um, good protein. <laughs> but I'm <laughs> vegan. <so>. <laughs> <laughs> Um, a plant predator. <laughs> <laughs> um, one thing that you, Steve, touched on as well before was about how uh, you know systems are intrinsically unstable, and that is part of their stability. You know, it's part of the way in which uh, things change is, is good. Change is necessary for a system to uh, maintain a state of health and vibrancy. And so I guess um, the first thing that change seems to do is to be disruptive. Mm. That's what we perceive when we say, oh, no, these things are dying because they need to make space for the new. 
or these things are uh, moving away and we cling because we don't like change. Um, and I guess uh, I don't really know um, what my specific writing uh, is here for, but what I do feel is that um, some writing is for, they're, they're both going to the same place, but some writing is to uh, provide, um, you know, the, the footing and the foundation for the new that is arriving. And some writing is there to be the change in the sense of like the disruptive force that, you know, allows for then the regeneration to occur. And I guess, um, I, I suspect that that is more where I fit in, uh, both with my actual scientific work, but also with, with this writing that, yeah, seems to be disruptive. But disruption of, the, of a linear way of seeing things, it's useful. And yeah, I, 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 like, to, 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 I like to think that some disruptive stories together with constructive stories are both required and they're both required together, not in separation, otherwise then we have the same old story, <laughs> which goes either one way or the other. And, um, and we know that neither of the two work on their own. Like even a beautiful fairy tale is not very useful because we are not living fairy tales. And so, yeah, I think uh, a nice grounding it's required and grounding is both about change and disruption as well as uh, creation and new. The earth is a very great example as always. Mm -hmm. She can create new earth out of a very disruptive volcano. <laughs> so, yeah. Can I just add to that? Uh, our society tells itself this great story like most societies do and our great story is suicidal it's economic rationalism growth for the sake of growth endless mm. destruction our role as writers and artists is to disrupt that mm. and i think that's fairly mm. fundamental we are going to go to questions after this next question that i put to the panel um so you know please start to like work up uh, your questions. Um, some tips on asking questions at writers festivals, um, just because it can be really tricky to delineate between a question and a comment. <laughs> and so a question, um, you'll notice that it, it it's, it's asking something that you don't know and it's often, it kind of goes up at the end, whereas <laughs> a statement is just flat. Um, so just consider that uh, when you're putting together your questions. So I just want to return to the central question of this panel. Is it too late to regenerate the earth? And if not, where do we start? And we've talked about so many abstract things here today. But what's something that we can take away? And I mean something beyond like, you know, get a Tesla and, and change your superannuation. But like what, where, where, where do we start in terms of our stories, in terms of ourself, in terms of how we regenerate? Is it too late? And where do we start? Okay. Have you wanted to go? Yeah. No, no, it's fine. Uh, okay, so look, I mean, I've already run my flag up the mast, haven't <laughs> I? Uh, uh, you, 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 you must start as an individual person with, with a vision of where things need to move. Mm. Th then you've got to work through the consequences of the fight that you're about to embark upon and ask yourself, mm. is it realistic and achievable? And who do I need <laughs> by my side in order to get there? So, so I'm after acti activities that are consistent with, as Charles put it, um, you know, a, a reformation of, of uh, human affairs in relation to environment. Mm -hmm. but, but, but for me, it's, it, I am excited by those who are practical. And so I, I put my effort... I mean, I'm not a practical person. Uh, you know, I'm probably the least, mm -hmm. among the least. But, but I love working with practical people. And, and seeing vision played out in real life with real activities on the ground. That's how I get my satisfaction. That's where I put my effort. The things that I do in my advisory and other life is backing those sorts of initiatives. Will any single one of them solve the planet's problems? No. That, that, that's not how it works. This is a long grind. This is hundreds of years of work now. 
for, for human beings to get out of the paradigm they've set themselves up into and which are causing so many mortally dangerous um, problems, it, it will not happen overnight. So, so you've got to be committed to the long term here. You simply have to be. Otherwise, you're unrealistic. Um, so, having said all that, I, I don't think that it's possible for, for me to sit here and say, well, you all should do this. I mean, I am so tired of being preached at, I can't tell you. But what, what I want you to do is to think it through for yourself mm -hmm. and, and decide what it is that you're going to do that is achievable in your life and consistent with your capabilities and capacities. That, that's what I want people to do. And, and writers and, and thinkers inspire you in, in going down that pathway of hard thinking. That you, you're not being over-optimistic. This isn't Pollyanna. Uh, these are serious challenges. Um, but, but, but the misanthropy that's so often bred by pessimism but can, can blind people to the extraordinary nature of the human brain. What, what we can't do when we put our minds to it. That, that's why, whether it's trust or hope, uh, I'm signed on to the future. Mm -hmm. um, I really liked what you said, Mon, around that idea of falling in love with the earth um, and having a really firm love affair. The dreaming was told to me to have, I mean, it's, it's incredibly multifaceted, past, present, future. It crosses so many um, thresholds and it, and it brings everything together and it removes that hierarchical way of thinking of, mm -hmm. you know, person animal that we eat, other animal, plant. Um, and in learning about the dreaming, this elder had sat me down and, and had said that, you know, one of the really important parts of it is our relationship with the earth, that we must care for Mother Earth, that we must love her, and that we must take the time to appreciate her. He's like, you know, when you go see your mother, you tell her she's beautiful, right? The earth loves to hear that. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and, and to know that her wisdom is, is heard. Um, and on that vein, I often sit kids with gum trees um, in gardens with their back to the tree. I make them sit and look at them for a while without conversation just to observe them and to pay attention to their little folds and the scribbles all over them, the things that crawl up them, their colours. And then I make them turn their back to the tree and sit with their head on the tree and just listen. Mm -hmm for as long as they're comfortable to listen. Um, and then to write their experience. You know, what wisdom did the tree tell you? This tree is obviously a spirit, an ancestor reincarnated. And it can't walk in this lifetime, but it could walk in the lifetimes before. What knowledge does it have? And kids write the most profound things. So go and sit with a tree. Um, take the time to appreciate the earth. And then um, go and find a project that's happening in your community. Um, you know, the she oaks with, for the black cockatoos is one that happens in mine. And planting on farms um, is something that I've got to find more time to do. So, mm -hmm. well, look, as you've probably gathered, I'm I'm optimistic. Mm -hmm. uh, from my wide travels and what's now emerging, we have the solutions out there to regenerate landscape function. Uh, but I don't believe that solutions are going to come from the top, uh, political, etc. It's I, I I call it an underground revolution, playing on the healthy soil aspect. It's an insurgency and, uh, and it needs to be a partnership between us and uh, people in the urban world as well demanding healthy food off healthy landscapes and we have to deliver healthy food and fibre off those landscapes and uh, that partnership is, is what's going to enable us to regenerate those earth systems. It, and it won't be regenerated back to where it originally was, it'll be different, but it'll at least be a lot healthier. Well, coming at last is always like, yeah, I agree with all of those. <laughs> um, and then there is um, another layer, I guess, and I'm just talking for myself, and I don't know if, as Steve said, I don't like to be preached, I don't like to preach, and I hope uh, everyone can find their own way. But um, for me, um, I really need it. I, I realize that for me, this um, what I see as uh, the crisis outside. Uh, it's um, it's a totally internal process, really, uh, because I don't really know what action is the right action. I mean, in fairness, we have made as humanity, we have made a lot of actions, which we made them in in good faith or you know with a good intention. Then they turn out really bad, and. Um, and so I guess um, my feeling is that I don't really know, like I really do not know which one are the right 
action or the action that they are required. And the, the good news is that I don't need to know. Is that need for me to know and come up with this solution up here, uh, which of course can only come up from what I already know, uh, and so it's not very creative. Um, so I found that for me what works the best is to, um, by spending time with the trees or with the land and, and just uh, be quiet, um, I found that I can, yeah, I can allow the greater knowing to tell me where I am needed in terms of what I've come here, who am I and what I've come here to do. And then my body can move to those places and I don't actually need to know what I'm doing. I don't need to know where I'm going. Uh, I know that I'm being moved exactly where I need to be and I am doing exactly what, is, what it is that is needed. So the right action and the, and the right uh, thinking are not driven from up here, which is, I guess, the old school, you know, very um, westernized version of how to make decisions. <laughs> um, and instead is a totally uh, upside down approach, as the kids say. And, um, and to, I don't want to be cheesy or cliche, but it's like, it's the best way that I can say. It's like the heart knows and the, the mind is an amazing tool when it's guided by the heart. And so I don't have to decide or choose anything. I will just be doing exactly what is needed. And action is very important but the right action is what we need. So I think this is a really great opportunity for humanity as a whole, so every single one of us, to work out who we are and then do what we have come to do. And I suspect that we haven't come here to destroy the very place that is loving us so much. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. We do have time for a few questions. Is there anyone who has some questions? We've got a mic just here. We'll just start at the front. Uh, good morning and thanks for your discussion. It's great. Um, my question's more along a scientific rather than an emotional theme, so I guess I'm kind of directing it to Stephen Charles. <laughs> and, um, but... Excuse me? <laughs> no, 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 but th uh, I'll just explain. Um, Valerie Taylor yeah, explain. <laughs> <laughs> Valerie Taylor said not too long ago that the oceans that she swam in with her husband, Rod, we will never see. David Suzuki has spent his lifetime advocating for the preservation of genetic diversity. Charles... Um, sorry, Monica, you said that change was necessary for a system to maintain a sense of vibrancy. Now, my question then relates to, have we destroyed a critical gene mass that means that we will never return, despite how much we try to regenerate? It's a scientific question based upon the ability for that ecosystem to regenerate. Because if you've destroyed an alphabet and only left with five letters, how do you speak the language? How does, the, how does that ecosystem or the ecology regenerate when the building blocks are going so quickly? Monica? <laughs> Charles? Somebody? Okay, help. I'm going to answer, being the scientist here. <laughs> yeah. I got it. My mind is listening. Thank you. <laughs> the question is very simple, actually, and it's maybe a misunderstanding of what this uh, genetic code really is. Evolution is not um, a, an inventor. It doesn't create anything new. It plays and it tinkers with very simple, basic building blocks. And with those, it has created so much diversity over and over again, and it's doing it even now. So. Who makes you think that because we are losing some, that we cannot, as an evolutionary process, we cannot uh, create new, maybe very different forms, 
Maybe the majority are going to be bacteria. But hey, it's still life. What your question is really highlighting, which is important, I think, to, to, to speak of, is the fact that um, it's not so much, a, it, we are not really concerned about biodiversity, let's face it. We are concerned about ourselves. Because the evolutionary process will recreate life in very different forms, and biodiversity is not going to be a problem. The question is, are we going to be the one present to actually count? Charles? Well, it's a hell of a question. Um, I tend to side with Monica. I, I think um, the processes of adaptation and evolution are all still in play. We, we might have simplified the tool or diminished the toolkit. Uh, but there's some other new stuff that really encourages me, which is coming out of some of the research by um, health workers in the States working on the microbiome uh, to do with things like uh, Roundup glyphosate, how it's destabilising it. And, and it's now emerging that we are an intimate part, a far more intimate part of our environment than we thought. For example, we're probably about 15% microRNA from bacteria uh, absorbed through our guts. Or if you go for a walk up in, in, in the bush, you're imbibing microparticles from plants, some of which are microRNA that we incorporate, and so on and so on. And um, so we are indivisible with Mother Earth, which is really supporting the, the sort of intuitive deep wisdom of, of in indigenous people, that we're indivisible from, from Mother Earth. And then there's other things in the microbiological world that it looks like um, when you get to a critical mass of health in the soil, you've got plants communicating with uh, bugs, biology in the soil through chemistry. And if you eat the right or the wrong foods, those communicate with us by switching our genes on and off. So the indivisibility of us with life uh, is gobsmacking and it, it reinforces all those views that what we do to the earth, we do to ourselves. But uh, I, I still see, like Monica, that that, that language of um, amino acids and the different uh, nucleic acids, etc., uh, whilst we might have simplified it through the wiping out of species, that the material is still there to continue that evolution process. But I don't know enough about evolutionary biology, to be honest, to fully answer it. Steve, do you mind if, Steve, do you mind yeah. if I just... Uh uh, bud in for a second. Yeah, no, you, you know, I'm not in charge. <laughs> <laughs> just, I, I just. Uh, I mean, yes, I'm not in charge. <laughs> <laughs> just, Charles, you reminded me of a very simple example of this uh, concept. It's like we assume that uh, having a nervous system and a central nervous system, so the nervous system in the brain is this uh, highly evolved blah blah thing, you know. And of course, we are at the apex of this evolutionary process. But it turns out that actually sponges, which are at the base of the animal kingdom, and so much at the base that some people actually think that they are plant, but they are animals, um, they have the genes, the code for a nervous system. Just simply, they never went that way. So we, know, we need to acknowledge that we know so little of how actually this world works. How do we know that the moment you wipe out certain species, some species which have all the toolkits there, decide, oh, all right, time to make a new system, a new organism. We, we, got, the, we got the things. We can, we can even build a nervous system, even if we never needed it before. So again, the reservoir is uh, it's big enough. It's, it's simple or small enough, but big enough in the potential. Just to, just to keep on, we will just keep on moving and go to Steve, just because I'm aware there may be other questions yeah, in the room. I'll try and answer quickly. Yours is a serious question. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and just to follow it through, I think it's probable, more than 50% likely, that the Great Barrier Reef will turn over the next 50 years into something quite different. And, and most of us will see it as a decline, which in human perception and value it will be. It'll turn into another ecosystem. It'll be occupied by other species that do better. It may not be that the coral reef genomes disappear. There are already Red Sea coral communities that persist under very high water temperatures. And it may be that the genetic material in there is the, is the source for subsequent recolonization, who knows? So that the, it's, it's one of these unfolding and probably inexorable challenges that I mentioned in one of my opening remarks. 
Uh, how do you respond to it? Depends on your point of view. Uh, you, you can toss your hands in the air and say, I told you so, humans are, are just evil, greedy um, species and we don't deserve to be here. Or you can say, well, what, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? So I, I'm in the latter camp, as I've explained. Um, we, we'll try all sorts of ways to save the reef um, because it's value to us. But, but equally, we don't want to fall into the trap of saying, all's lost, oh, woe is us. Um, I, I think Monica and Charles are right. The, nature is incredibly inventive. We keep kidding ourselves that we can tell it what to do. Hmm. Uh, experience over and over again shows that the e ecosystems have their own t t tendencies to go which way they're going to go. You try and turn them around. It's enormously difficult work. That there is tremendous creative uh, potential in there. Um, the, our, 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 our um, what's the word? Um, fate is to be living through a time of the most dramatic change and seeing so much going and being unable to see what will replace it. That, that, that's our fate. Um, just while we wait for another question, Curly, do you have anything you'd like to weigh on this? I love that yeah. you ask the non-scientist to answer a science question. Yeah, good on you, Curly. Yeah. <laughs> no, um, I mean, I, I, I agree that I'm probably not the person to answer. Um, but you don't know what you know until you know, and then you find out that the things you knew were probably wrong and that there's so much more to know. So I like to hope that as, yeah, along those realms of um, the, more that we, the more that we find out, the more questions we have, the more we start to respond to those and to find new answers and to formulate new ideas. And um, I think it's an exciting time to be on the verge of, you know, threatened species, um, evolving species, um, us being responsive and hopefully adaptive and hopefully forward thinking, yeah. Are there just over to the right here? Hi. Um, I like to hear what you're talking about. And like myself, being Indigenous from here, we have different ideas about the climate change and our land and the way that we would have looked after it. Mm if it wasn't for 250 years, be invaded. And because we had already looked after it for many thousands of years. And, but our voices never get heard. We have short programs in, um, around here now about our young people working on the land in, near our parks. And that's a big step for us here, and we need more of it. But the rest of Australians should be listening to Indigenous people who are the experts of this country and this land. And I think that's so important, because where I came from, just over here, east, is a cattle station where I, they introduce the buffalo grass, and it's everywhere, and it's so hot, you burn it and it burns all these sacred trees. Not like the natural grass used to be. So there's that that really makes me angry. Yeah. Yeah, I will. So people have to... Sorry. <laughs> Keep going. Keep going, anyway. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> But you need to really look at indigenous people of them areas. They are the experts in their land. Because... We've been here a long time. Thank you. Thank you. And following on from that, I think maybe the question, if there was one, might have been how, in our experience, in our realms, have we been working with Indigenous people? Would that be right to ask? Um, and I suppose I mentioned earlier working with the um, Gumia Darawal followers down on the Shoalhaven River to regenerate bushland by um, using their traditional burning techniques um, and they inform the real fire service in the local area to do all of the back burning um, and they, they burn in the circle to to return the fire back and you know paying attention to the wind it's a cool fire um, it burns out it restores all of the plant life it opens the seeds um, so yeah you know I think we're, we're trying to find ways to, to do it and that's one example of the way that we've witnessed it um, you mentioned that you work with the Narigo Elder, yeah. Yeah, I've become uh, good friends with a senior lawman from our local people in Garrigo, man. 
and we run uh, with him. Uh, well, he, he runs it and we provide the, uh, the landscape to do uh, autumn cool burning um, to regenerate both species and heal the country and lay down charcoal, everything you'd know ten times better than I do. Uh, and that's also to let a very conservative district know that we value this uh, extraordinary knowledge that um, is there. And the more time I, I spend with him, and, and being a white fellow, I have it's trickled out very slowly year by year, as it should be, um, but he's allowing me to picture what the landscape was before the white people came, and that's hugely important because one of the things we've done in both grazing and cropping in Australia is destroy, in, in our sort of country, the small water cycle, and m most farmers, when you tell them that, don't know what it is. So uh, I find it both incredibly rewarding and I'm in kindergarten still, basically. <laughs> Uh, can I make a quick comment? Yep. Uh, Pat, Pat, just quickly, you, you, you're spot on. Mm -hmm. So The things that excite me over the last uh, uh, 20 years have been the development of the Indigenous Protected Areas Program, the creation of these... Um, <laughs> excuse me? <laughs> uh, the, the Indigenous <laughs> Ranger Program, which, which goes from strength to strength, and, and the willingness of Aboriginal groups to put themselves together under the 10 Desert Alliance to look after that vast area of the Western Desert. Th these are inspirational initiatives. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of you for joining us. Please put your hands together for Monica, Charles, Curly and Steve. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. Thank you.